forgot to do that. And like I said, I didn't plan on being did he even, presented anyway. Did he reach out to you? Um, I thought that mine, I, when I sent him mine on Friday, I thought that it like didn't send through. So I emailed it to him again on Sunday. And he was like, oh no, I received yours. I sent out a letter to Aaron. Did that go to you by chance? But it didn't. So I'm just making sure that he, he got a hold of you. Uh, he might have. I could check. Because he just needed like one slide um, to present like 30 minutes on at the beginning of the event. Mm -hmm. As far as printing goes, do you just like are you going to use the office max or something to print out your poster? Uh, NDSU has a poster printing oh, they do. service. Oh, in, cool. uh, oh, it's a building across the street from Dunbar. Iac or Quentin Burdick. Yeah, Quentin Burdick. They have a printing center in there. The barbecue building. Or barbecue. <laughs> Yeah, it used to be Quentin Burdick, and then they changed it to Iron. Well, thanks much for finding possible to come. Um, we will do have an event this Thursday and Friday, right? And we better help each other to uh, improve the posters. John, even even if you haven't uh, registered, you are welcome to come and uh, uh, whatever apply for reimbursement, which will be covered if you just want to stop by and chat. Okay, I'll I think I'll probably end up doing that then. I'll talk to Levi yeah. and uh, make sure he's around. Okay. So, uh, how to print if. Do you know Amy, who is the chemistry secretary? Yes. So if you approach her, she should be able to either help herself or direct you to Diona. Well, they have a network of, of uh, like administrators. If they issue, a, well, you can print on your own and then submit for reimbursement, but they can issue a form which uh, will like a voucher for free printing well it's not in fact free but it will be free for you and with this voucher you are coming to this uh, qbb uh, first floor in a reasonable time not not in the middle of the night but like before 6 p.m probably before, before 6 p.m on, on wednesday because the actual conference starts on, on thursday and they will they will print also, there is a printing service in the uh, Memorial Union, but uh, then you need to pay and then apply for reimbursement. Okay? And I'm just thinking of myself. If you prepare a poster until the last minute and it is ready only like 5 a.m. at the day of presentation, uh, one can go to any FedEx Kinkos that print in the, in the middle of the night or whatever. What else? Uh, do, do you know your schedules when you need to present? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I'm third. On, are you talking about like the, um, the three minute like yes. overview? Yeah, I'm, I'm third on Thursday. Uh, did you all send the one slide summary? Do you plan to do it? Right. I think he already compiled them. Okay. He sent an email saying like he was going to compile them all. Those are the abstracts. The, the the thing that he sent out yesterday, those are the abstracts. Do not, do, not, do not hesitate. Just take your name, title, and maybe one most attractive picture and put it on one page slide. So it's like two minutes work. Okay. Do, do not feel much responsible for the content. Um, so, I have printed uh, copies for everyone, so we will just listen to presenter and uh, make the comments. John, you may, I don't know how you will arrange it, but you can collect comments by handwriting or whatever and then uh, share it by email and feel free to stop the presenter. We, we are not in a rush uh, for 
one with three posters and two hours limit, we can be very relaxed if you will finish early. Okay. Um, so, based on today's meeting, please try to re return your feedback to authors, authors implement and print tomorrow sometimes. Okay. I have no idea where you need to hang the posters. Probably you will figure it out. What do we do next? Excuse me. It is too early for the GRFP, so probably GRFP will go in two weeks. And next Tuesday we will uh, look for open deadlines for conferences other than Senable. And also, um, I have to write a proposal and I may invite you to help just bring bring in, I don't know, like page, paragraph, two pages, whatever, uh, in, uh, so it will be things that John and Aaron are doing, so on, on Perf Skites, but uh, all of us can, can contribute something there. So proposal and future conferences ne next time. So how do we do the um, pre presentations. We have both PowerPoint and um, both PowerPoint and uh, PDF of the posters. So you can bring your slides. Up front and just uh, focus our attention to whatever you need to discuss about, right? And then you, uh, because the whole poster will be not visible, and then you can just uh, browse through and point our attention on, on necessary part. Okay. So, uh, Aaron, Yvonne, and then, then uh, Dane. So you, you have. Please feel free to start, and I will distribute. So, I'll be presenting on uh, perovskite quantum dots with using them for uh, applications and enhancing their photoluminescence properties through doping with a manganese ion. So, blood halide perovskites have been popular for the last uh, five years or so because they're good absorbers and the, they're good absorbers they're cheap to make and they have tunable emission so you can use them for opto electronic properties and the one issue that arises in the in perovskite quantum dots is that over their oh sorry I'm looking for they can have a short lifetime for a PL lifetime due to degradation to either through moisture or through uh, oxygen degradation or just through phase transition. So there's been uh, motivation to try to get stable emission out of these perovskites. And one method that's come recently is through uh, manganese doping, which has been popular in other semiconductor quantum dots as well. And so, and then recently it's been shown that you can get stable emission from introducing uh, manganese dopants into perovskite. Uh, quantum dots, you can get stable 600 nanometer emission, so roughly orangish red emission out of these. So the purpose of this presentation is to characterize the, the method that these uh, perovskite nanocrystals uh, luminous. So basically their ground state electronic structure, their the spin configuration of the manganese dopant, which will be important for the mechanism as to how it photoluminesces. And yeah, those are the main things that we're going to be looking at. So the hypothesis that we started out with when we went into this is that due to the crystal field splitting of the manganese ion being inside the inside the crystal that we'd see substantial crystal field splitting. So for the manganese ion, there's two spin configurations that it likes to take, it's either a high or a low or sextet or a singlet configuration. 
and we figured that the six to, or the singlet configuration would provide the the necessary energy offset to get the 600 nanometer emission from the perovskites. Mm -hmm. uh, phones are general suggestions. It's a matter of taste. Even if printed large, it is too much of continuous text. Okay. Um, most of, well, not most, but about half of audience can be impatient to read through long uh, sentences. So one may decide to do broken, like, bullet, bullet points. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something that one can skim through without looking where is the verb, where is the end of sentence. Uh, for crystal field splitting, the, um, what, what you show as sextet here shows zero crystal field splitting. This will induce objections or questions. So, uh, you may explicitly introduce this delta. You may show the schematic of which uh, ligands are interfacing the magnetic ion. Mm -hmm. And even maybe without math, because we, we do not have space, but show, explain main principle why the orbitals are splitting. And uh, what, what does it mean, low spin and, and high spin? I was just going to download for myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another thing too, um, as far as like the font itself goes, it might be good, I, I ought to do this myself, but it might be good to use a font with feet on it, like Times New Roman. It just makes it easier to read things on paper. That has feet? Yeah, so like, um, right now it looks like you're using a Calibri font. If you were to use one like Times New Roman, your H would have like a foot on it. Like I learned it in our uh, writing in the sciences course that on paper you want to use fonts that have this rather than this for like paper. This is more for like online reading. This is on like, paper font. Okay. Something to consider. <clears throat> Uh, John raised. Yeah, I, so I just have um, one comment, one question, right? So I'm assuming the manganese is doping for a lead, correct? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be um, octahedrally coordinated within the system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another thing to potentially look at is for specific um, geometries of dopants um, can direct. So the geometries can direct the levels of splitting that can occur um, in the crystal field. Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember um, what first row transition metals like gravitate more towards, um, but it might give a good idea of, of what you might expect. Um, and just another piece of information for you to back up whatever you find. So it's over a coordination of the manganese. Yeah, that can it can definitely play a role in, in which type of splitting is, is prioritized. No, it is not visible for John. <laughs> I, I, I think he, he means uh, image like this in, in the upper. Right, yeah, that's kind of... And uh, in could. the audience of uh, professional chemists, it will most appeal. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So did, did he show you, like, some kind of, like, um, delta O or delta... Is, is that what you had drawn, Dr. Killen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, because one of the other things, I guess, that I was, I was thinking more along the lines of is the difference in coordination chemistry... Um, for something that's changing the splitting can actually direct high versus low spin, um, which in this case, it, I mean, it might be pretty straightforward, but that's also another uh, another thing to kind of check into. Okay. And so then going off this, I planned 
on uh, making a figure that took single point calculations from VAS for just forcing it into each spin configuration and then showing that the minimum is going to be a, for the for the sext sextet configuration. So that'd be you know, kind of blocked off in this area. So that gives motivation of why we're investigating a specific uh, spin configuration in these systems. And then NERSC was down for the weekend, so I wasn't able to generate DOS and uh, Spectra for all these. You can report it on the conference. Right. <laughs> Well, I plan to do it this weekend, and I got that, that's, sat down that's Friday. Fine. Now, that's so. fine. You can do a nice presentation without any results at all. <laughs> so then, yeah, those would be comparing the spin polarized versions with the spin orbit coupling, because we can see, well, going over on the right hand side for our spin de dependent uh, configurations for the dopant. Um. Mm -hmm. Methods first, results second. Okay. So. And same, you can also swap in the your like spatial arrangement of, of material. So I should move the bottom. But, the yeah, bottom panels yes, up. Yes. Okay. So yeah, we calculate the dose just by sifting through the energies of all the orbitals and then count and then counting the number of states for each energy. Then we do calculate our absorption spectrum by uh, doing this sifting through differences in energy between all the orbitals and then weighting them by the oscillator string, which isn't shown presently, but that just gives the probability of transition occurring in these systems. And then my methods are still a little bit lax, but to compute the excited state, or how do I want to say this? To, uh, we want to compute the quantum yield after excitation of the system. So we have to take a specific excitation and then we allow the system to relax to the homo lumo band edges or the electron and hole to relax to the homo lumo band edges. And we do that using uh, excited state dissipative dynamics shown in these equations here, where the first term is just. Uh, conserve or your normal uh, time evolution for quantum states, and then the second term is the dissipative, which is uh, electron losing energy due to phonon interactions in the crystal. So that relaxes the excited electron down to the band edge. And then we can compute just changes in occupations by uh, counting the uh, electron density for each energy levels, and then. While the system relaxes, we can also compute the radio, the probability of radio, radiative relaxations as it's decaying. So basically, we the electron decays a little bit, and then we also and then we track the probability of a photoluminescence occurring between electron and hole at that stage, and we just keep doing it iteratively until it relaxes to the band edge, and then eventually we compute the quantum yield, which I don't have shown on the equations yet, which I plan to implement. Questions? Mm -hmm. So, um, everything is correct, everything is right, but uh, there is an impression that you are hiding most um, impressive details, either for brevity or because you do not feel 100% comfortable with them. Probably mix of both. <laughs> but um, in the audience of visitors to the poster, you will be the world star. You will be best expert in this uh, area. There will be f few other people who just blindly run a initial software like a black box. But you can pose yourself as a big leader who, who knows something above just plain use. So even you do some mistakes, no one will realize. And you, you, you will look uh, very favorable if you show something that makes you stand out from, from the average. Mm -hmm. So do, do not hesitate. E even if you do some little mix-up, that's fine. It, it is more important to stand out. It's uh, better than uh, 
just hide it. Generally, you do whatever you like, but it's, you can get benefits of being a, how to say, stand out, self advertising. Um, spinners, what are they? They. Do not answer me, just plan to, to introduce. Okay. And you can be teacher of 100 visitors to a poster about spinners. It's not a secret for last, uh, whatever, 80 years, but most of people even who do uh, calculations and call them some, so themselves theorists, either do not know about them or try to avoid them. Because uh, avoiding uh, intellectual challenge. So if you just tell a little bit, you will stand out again. So even if you tell about the method details and tell about spinners and declare your goals, stop. You're already a hero. But if you add something uh, mid of the results, it will be true standing out in square. Mm -hmm. yeah, that all makes sense, I guess. Well, I'm just kind of hesitating because I, I haven't thought about how to lay out the narrative yet. So it's like do, do, do not, do not. You will be the best expert in the field, in 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 the audience. There will be no, uh, well, you 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 see other experts here in the room. Right? Mm -hmm. All others will be less uh, prepared to speak about the subjects. Okay. So then. Yes. How do I zoom out here? Just this finger. Oh, two fingers. Oh, this. Yes. And so, <coughs> again, I'm just trying to frame. So, initially, since we figured that the low spin contribution, where the photoluminescence would come from, we would do spin polarized calculations for our orbitals, which would allow which allow spin or which spin, which doesn't require spin flip transition, so we don't need spin orbit coupling. So we would expect transitions from either spin alpha to spin alpha states or spin beta to spin beta states to account for the, uh, the correct band gap that's seen experimentally. But what we find is that the spin allowed transitions do are either too wide or too narrow to account for emissions coming experimentally from the doped perovskite. So that means that we have to have spin forbidden transitions in these systems, which necessitates the need for spin orbit coupling in spinner orbitals to describe them, which is shown with this arrow here. And we can see that for a spin forbidden transition, it's going to have a high probability of occurring too, because the HOMO is on the, on the metal ion itself, and then the LUMO is on the manganese metal ion itself too, so it's a metal-metal transition. So it has very high probability of occurring. And I guess I'm not quite sure what more else to say at this point. Let's discuss, ask some uh, tricky questions to Aaron. I guess I have a question for myself. So, please. I know for. So it seems like the occupied orbitals, the metal ions, they have like a high degree of splitting between their states. So you can see that there's only these two are centered on the manganese, and the perovskite home was here. So that must mean that the other three occupied on the manganese must be below the perovskite. But then for the LUMO, all the spin states they're basically degenerate. There's like a tenth of an EV gap between all of them. Mm -hmm. It just cool. seems odd to me because it seems like a a mix. So you see uh, beta fi uh, three D orbitals of manganese and you miss three out of two, three out of five uh, alpha 3D orbitals of manganese in this uh, image. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they must be within the, the conduction band of the perovskite. 
I have some idea how to address it, but uh, do we realize the problem? So there should be total five orbitals with uh, spin beta and five orbitals with spin alpha that are sitting on the uh, D metal. So for beta, well, first, Aaron didn't declare, uh, well, it is kind of self evident, but it's better to declare that although main calculations and main results deal with non-collinear results, non-collinear data. This diagram shows only spin polarized. Spin polarized. Polarized data. And then we do have a contradiction between our intuitive expectation or uh, diagram from a textbook or this two and uh, three orbitals are split by delta octahedral. And the fact that the energies of alpha orbitals and beta orbitals are very non-equal. So on the, on the diagram here, we draw a level, and then we can place an electron up or down, or same as you do here, right? Mm -hmm. But in fact, if you run for spin polarized calculations, instead of such figure, you will first have two sets of figures. One for spin alpha, where you will be up, 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 and then second for spin beta, for down, down. And then with this calculation, this self-consistent cycle, you will see that the alpha and beta orbitals, which we show the same energy, can, like alpha orbitals, can drop much deeper down so that they will be masked, they will be hidden inside the conduction band, well, inside the valence band, composed of iodine uh, 2p states. Mm -hmm. Is that? I no, guess initially, yes? I guess initially I just thought it was some sort of hybridiz hybridization effect, possibly. No, 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 the, uh, this feature pops up in most calculations with magnetic materials. If you look onto... Sorry, did you say magnetic materials? Yes, yes, mag magnetic. So if you have different number of electrons with quantum number of, uh, with up and down, each spin has magnetic moment and you'll feel the magnet. So you can... Well, if you have just one magnetic ion, probably you cannot move it too much in space, but if you put more of those, you can just pull this quantum dot out of solvent by a magnet. Or at least see some, some floating towards the towards magnet. So as expected that there's supposed to be three pairs of spin up, spin down, but that's not, that's not the, the case and that's where the confusion comes in? Am I right mm -hmm. to understand? Yes. yes. Okay. Actually five. You know, number of five orbital, of d orbitals is five. And for uh, spin down, Aaron does see that there are five orbitals. But for spin up, there are only two. And mm -hmm. Yeah, show up within the gap anyway. It, it, it is a confuse. Um, a message personally to Aaron. If you look on Hugo, well, Hugo is his uh, 
uh, it's not in a formal name, it's not in paper. G with G. I never called him in his passport name. How do you, pro what is his first name? Gu. Gu? Yeah. Okay, Gu Yao. Uh, and he uh, agrees, well, Yao. Gu Yao. Um, I shared his paper last night with you, mm -hmm. and if you look on figure four, it does show the image, the typical image of spin polarized um, density of states, and it shows same as we always do, occupied and unoccupied mm -hmm. conduction band, valence band. And for deep in the, in the valence band and up and uh, very high in the conduction band, those are symmetric, those. But inside the gap, they're very unsymmetric. And well, he, did, he didn't uh, work with d orbitals, he worked with f orbitals. But those that are, he also had very uh, polarized, same like five, and un unpaired un electrons, he has this case. It is uh, one before European. In periodic table, the lanthanide that is... Gadolinium? No, gadolinium is one after European. It has seven... Mm, samarium? Samarium, yes, for sam samarium. SM3 plus also has five unpaired. And alpha electrons, are very close to valence band, and as we we, uh, we show, as we symbolize them with, uh, as we symbolize them with uh, um, field, they are seen like this. And unoccupied f electrons, they are shifted by. I don't know, like four electron volts towards conduction band. So this is a manifestation of uh, of the of the effect that uh, we we have uh, energies of alpha and beta electrons are very non-equal. Okay, so just from this diagram, like this red peak is just shifted to the left a little bit more. Mm -hmm. oh, so wh what to do? Uh, if you do PDOS image for spin polarized, you will see where are the rest of manganese d orbitals. Mm -hmm. So, what's the band gap for this material without doping? Without doping? Yeah. It would be. Uh, it would be like two four. I guess maybe that's the reason, because for Hugo's work, for sodium neutral fluoride, I guess the calculated band gap may be like six. Yes. And then all alpha and beta yeah. were inside the gap. Yeah. But they were offset by like three, four EV. So if the, if the manganese uh, alpha orbitals, they can be like two, two electron volts below the Fermi energy inside the valence band. Okay, I'll be... make sure to make that figure. Investigate where those orbitals are. And... So I guess that uh, somewhat resolves that question. And any other questions on this figure? Oh, not on the figure, oh. but on the presentation itself. Um, <coughs> So, because Dr. Gillian said that there's not going to be a ton of people professional on your specific topic, how, like, if I were to come up with no background knowledge of what's going on here, what, why would I be interested in it? Like, what's, what, what, what are your results prove to help the scientific community? These are pre preliminary results for well, ultimately, we want to calculate quantum yield or quantum efficiency or photoluminescence efficiency in these systems. So that's the ultimate goal. 
But up to here, we just, we haven't gotten that far yet. We just calculated ground state electronic structure. So we've kind of nailed down what electronic structure this system likes to be in. And we kind of, you know, we know the mechanism for the electronic transitions that occur. So we figured that out. And then the next is doing the dynamics and then doing the excited state electron dynamics. How about like real world applications? More like, strategically. Oh, yeah. oh, like practical applications? Yes. Yes. Oh, well, I mean, but normally without doping, these quantum dots, they have, well, they're good emitters, but they tend to have short lifetimes. So if you put manganese in there, you can get stable emission for a longer lifetime of so, a desired so like, wavelength. So like they can use these quantum dots in like the new televisions and stuff? And exactly, longer, yes. Longer lifetime for them? Yeah, could be used in televisions. Well, you'd only have one emission, so you couldn't do all the colors, but you could do lasing, like optical electronics. Like if you just wanted a short pulse of a 600 nanometer emission. Uh, sorry for touching it without mm -hmm. your permission. So, Aaron presents results which already have a lot of investments into uh, developing a structure that mimics what people try, are trying to do in an experiment and tries to do best uh, possible in the world um, surface coverage of this quantum dots. The main enemy of good light emitter are surface traps. So the orbitals that belong to intrinsic uh, iodine or whatever, bromine p orbitals here and lead S orbitals mm -hmm. are for best emission properties must be localized in the center of quantum dot. But see, even if with this very carefully designed organic shell, they look like a little threads, so they like to localize close to the surface, which means they will be not ideal for emission. On experiment, you just do a dirty and silly work. You repeat synthesis again, 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 do many samples, and one out of whatever, if you are lucky five, or if you are unlucky of thousand, you have a bright emitter. The rest will be garbage with this uh, surface states. And if you look to industry, it's not good. It's too expensive to do too many attempts. But if one places a dopant inside, no matter what is on the surface, it will emit, because it is, uh, as already showing, it is transition from metal to metal. So, it doesn't answer you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that when you give your like two or three minute oral introduction on your poster, that that'll be important to talk about. Seeing as there's not going to be a lot of people that might be interested in it, it'll be it'll be like important to make them interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be good. Like, if people just want the highlights. Yeah, I what's think, important you know, about this? Make people think that it's some crazy new, you know, like convince them that they want to come to your poster out of all the other hundreds that are going to be there or whatever. Or tens or whatever, how many people are going to be there. Okay. Um, it's my only comment. More questions? John is about to design a question, but he is not sure. Which one? So just after, I mean, this little this discussion we've had. Um, so am I reading this right? So when you look at the five D orbitals that you have in the beta spin, that they are. Well, I guess I'm a little confused on the labeling you have. So you have the lumo of the quantum dot for beta. You have the homo of the quantum dot and then you have the 5D orbitals in between them. So are you saying that these are like vacant or filled, just asymmetrical in the gap? Was that the discussion when you're talking about the spin polarized um, density of states? Um, 
I guess I missed what you're trying to get at. Like, okay, so the initial question is, are the five uh, d orbital splitting states that you show for the spin beta, are they filled or, or not filled? These ones up here? Or where's my pointer? Um, yeah, whatever the, the set of five is. The green ones, yeah, those are unfilled. Those are, okay. Yeah, they don't have so, an arrow with them, so. Okay, so are they lower in relative energy compared to what you have labeled as the LUMO of the quantum dot? Yes. The LUMO of the quantum dot is a, roughly a, oh, about zero. Yeah. Zero EV from Okay. I see the confusion. So the, the on the left-hand side, you see the arrow with the energy listed at each one of those levels, and the five spin beta isn't labeled, but all the other ones are. Two, well, and uh, the one between negative 2.34 and negative 3.14 is not labeled either. Right, yeah, I guess I see what you're saying. I guess when I was going through it, I thought I'd be too busy if I put okay. numbers so, for each of them. Because ones. yeah, I mean, right. So I mean, I guess I would I would at least put in maybe like a small t cartoon figure that just shows the relative energies of all of them, um, because it wouldn't make much sense to have something labeled as the LUMO with unoccupied states um, below it, just kind of um, yeah, without any anything to indicate you know, what, what you might be trying to highlight. Mm -hmm. I guess I see what you mean. Like it makes, well, I've been working on it for a while, so it makes sense to be a LUMO quantum dot, LUMO manganese, but probably wouldn't be as clear to others. Right. So I guess in my, so my other question is, so when you have it labeled as the, the HOMO for the manganese, um, I mean, so that's just the highest occupied of the manganese itself, but it, should it also be listed as the highest occupied of the quantum dot? Well, I guess in my brain, I partition it between states occupied on the quantum dot and the states occupied on the manganese ion, or that's due to the manganese ion. Okay. So, I mean, so I guess the way, the way, I mean, the way you think of it is more of like the core shell type idea where right. you have two separate fragments. Okay. Right, it's like because it, I mean, orbitals yeah, with just the orbitals intrinsic. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it could I be misconstrued just a little bit with, you know, since it's only a single atom dopant, you know, some people would potentially consider that just, you know, part of the quantum dot. So, I mean, I, I, I not understand after your explanation, I understand where you're coming from, but that could also be something that um, people might, might be a little curious about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's quite a bit I could be more explicit on in the poster or make more visually uh, clear. Oh, that's okay. You got you got a couple days yet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on Friday too, so I have an extra day. Oh, okay. Uh, can I approach with, with your permission? Feel free. Thank you. John? Uh, do you see the poster? Yes. So, no you don't. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Let me come to the notation mode and make something that will partially address some some of your some of your questions. So I would put the Lumo Alpha Homo Alpha and here Lumo Beta and Homo Beta because uh, they um, sometimes they're not equal. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, so I, I'm, I'm good with, I'm, I'm good with that. I was just a little bit curious on, you know, the relative energy within Beta itself on where those, the d orbital splitting was occurring. Okay. That energy difference wasn't Well, uh, I, I think Aaron did labeled the values of energies and aligned orbitals not randomly in uh, in the space of poster but putting them higher or lower depending on their relative energy and they're aligned with the numbers you can yes see. yes aligning with the numbers so this uh, figure is uh, twofold has twofold benefit on one hand it is energy diagram 
explicitly showing difference between alpha and beta uh, orbitals energy. On another hand, it is a spatial distribution of orbitals. Maybe maybe it would be beneficial um, to put another y-axis on the right-hand side, specifically for the green figures, and then have the left one just for the yellows, for your for your values of energy. It might might make things a little more clear. I don't know. I like what you have right now. I I understood. But. Yeah, I mean, mostly I'm just limited by, like. Not making the, the orbitals or the pictures too small so you can't resolve the orbitals. Because I would have to make them probably a little bit smaller to fit in that space, but I can play with it a little but bit. But I mean, too. like, if you like keep it just how you have, but just add another energy axis just to the right side so you can have your alpha energy scale and your beta energy scale on the same. You know, keep them all just how you have them right now. Just throw another one on there, maybe. Right. Or just throw saying. one. I put one in just here or just and scoop this over, and there's not really a, a lot of room to move it over unless I decrease the size of all these. I mean, or just throw in a Lumo manganese in that section of five, because I think that would, um, after, after the discussion, that would clear things up. Okay. Yeah, I could do that too. That's why I'd be the, yep. the most consistent way with what I already have. More questions? Did 40 minutes on my poster? Wow. Uh, okay, let's thank uh, Aaron for investing 40 minutes in the poster. John's got one more. Yeah, I'll just do one more. John, did you have more questions to Aaron? Well, no, so just, I mean, so just from, from your initial results, I mean, are you saying that, yes, this does indeed go to high spin? Yes. The sex tech right, given. is the most energetic. Okay. Perfect. Okay, perfect. And and when I was thinking about um, what I had said earlier, so given that you have an octahedrally coordinated manganese with iodine surrounding it, um, so they're usually iodines are usually like kind of like weak field splitting um, ligands, and if you have if you just look at um, like ligand field splitting theories, it should direct towards. Um, the high spin that you did see. So that's just in case you need a little chemical basis for initial hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good thing to mention. I know I did play around with doing chlorine too to see if I can get extra splitting from those, but those are basically sextet as well. So there wasn't a big change depending on the, the halide that was used. Okay. Uh, do, do not close it. Do not close it. Uh, okay. Just just put it out here. Minimize. Even would you like to, to show your. Uh... Okay. Let's check around if you. So this is where it's check six. Here. So you can just see. by fingers you can if you would like to here, expand right? because yeah. the, this three, size we, we don't see much. I get what you're saying, but it's just I wanted to squeeze that one in with the numbers on the side. Mm -hmm. it's like you could you could you could consider going for one. Three by three or three by four poster too. Okay, so basically in this study we are using time dependent excited state molecular dynamics to investigate the photo induced reactions of cyclohexane selenium. And uh, I guess the most important result is that in our simulation we observe several reactions, including uh, photopolymerization and also uh, hydrogen dehydrogenation. So here is a, a, a brief 
uh, introduction about time dependent state state molecular dynamics. So basically, we start with our simulation with the one electron quotient equations. By solving this, this equation, we can get the orbital and orbital energy. And the uh, time evolution of electronic degrees of freedom can be uh, calculated by solving the equation of motion according to this equation. So here, the first term is the Fock matrix, Fock operator, and the second one is the density operator. And here, this is the electronic dissipative transitions. So for the Fock matrix, we have three components. The first one is Gauss's Fock, and then we have nine band coupling. The third one is the uh, light to matter interaction. So this term is time dependent, but by applying some approximations, we can treat it as time independent. So, so based on Rabi theory, the Rabi frequency is related to transition type of moment and the uh, intensity of electrical field. So due to optically driven Rabi oscillations, uh, I should switch this to, but so we can have holes in the element of density matrix so that we can have stepwise change in occupation of two participating orbitals. So with this equation, we can update the electron density with new density, we can get new atomic forces. With new forces, we can get the uh, nuclear position. So in TDSMD simulations, the electronic degrees of freedom is coupled with nuclear degrees of freedom. But there is one problem. So in TDSMD simulations, the system has relatively large kinetic energy, so that there is bond elongation or bond contraction events. So we, in addition to TD, TDSMD simulations, we apply a post-processing technique. So that is, at the end of TDSMD simulations, we extract the intermediates from the trajectory, and then we save this intermediates and apply additional geometry optimization so that we can minimize the bound contraction or bound elongation events and also to remove uncertainty of the total energy. And after we apply this post-processing technique, we report the geometry as well as the total energy. Okay, so here is our result. So this is just a basic electronic structure for our initial input. So basically, our cell consists of two molecules, and we consider two configurations. The first one is two molecules is placed face to face, and second one is molecules uh, in side by side configuration. Yeah. Um, can you give a very brief introduction before we go to technical details? Same question as uh, Dean was asking to Aaron. Like, why this project has been started? I guess we have two reasons. So, the first one is experimental aid. Uh, some groups have found by applying UV irradiation, this liquid cyclohexanthane can turn into solid silicon. And I guess the second reason is we want to uh, prove our TDSMD simulation is, uh, how to say that, is very powerful. It can be used to simulate photo-induced process, like photofragmentation. Okay, so uh, you do not have any references to the um, designers of this molecule. Really. So you, you may add because they may come in person mm -hmm. and you want to give them credit. Mm -hmm. So they, they all work here. Okay. Um, the main challenge, scientific challenge that they addressed in the past is that they found a way to fabricate this uh, Cyclohexacylene. Theoretically, it was clear that such molecule exists, but they found a way to fabricate it efficiently and stabilize. And then you may sh uh, sh like copy paste from the, their paper a photograph of like a beaker with this transparent liquid. 
and uh, this is ink. It can be used as an ink, so you spray it onto a circuit, then apply UV light, and it becomes crystalline silicon. So you can, uh, instead of etching semiconductor circuits, you can draw them by a pencil or by a robotic uh, arm or, or whatever. And so main achievement was to design a way to fabricate this ink that polymerize and, and under light. And now um, we are trying to contribute to understanding of the background process, how does it polymerize. But it, it was not trivial to find and stabilize this molecule. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they're extremely proud of it. <laughs> Please keep going. Yeah. So I guess the most, one of the most important message we can get from here is the band gap for between home and loom is pretty large. So for our initial input, the band gap is maybe four electron volts. Which color? What? Which color of the visible range does it correspond to? How does this molecule appear visually? Transparent? Yes. So it's UV? Yeah. Absurd. Okay. So next, by using the previous mentioned input, we run TDSMD simulations, and then we apply post-processing technique. And then here, the A, B, C, D, this is for, from one trajectory by using the face-to-face -face configuration. And uh, I guess the most important thing is for the first figure, we can clearly say there is, I guess maybe, Polymerization is not the accurate word, but maybe dimerization happens. So, and uh, another interesting point is, if we look at the terminal atoms, we can form, uh, there are three hydrogens. So that means uh, in our simulation, we not only have the ring opening, but also we have the hydrogen migration events. And for other figures, we can see the dehydrogenation. And uh, for the bottom four panels, these are from another trajectory by using set-by-set -set configuration. And we can see the very interesting four-member ring and also three-member ring. Yeah, my final result is the simulated mass spectrum. So from TDSMD trajectories, we can just build the simulated mass spectrum. And uh, so the most strong peak is the single molecule peak. But in the high mass reg regime, we can see there are many high mass peaks. So this provides another evidence we have a uh, dimerization reaction in our simulation. That's it. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? So how would the mass spectrum look if there is no reaction? I guess if there is only fragmentation instead of dimerization, we can only observe fragments uh, with mass less than the single molecule. Okay, so what, what you want to, to say is that uh, from initial reactant, yes. there is a, this direction is fragmentation and this is polymerization. Yes. And you probably can even mark it on a poster because some visitors will come for very uh, short interval of time and they may yeah. doesn't want to, to put the <laughs> marks by some reason. I don't know. It's on the edge, but one can make uh, an arrow showing that uh, one side it is uh, 
fragmentation and another is polymerization. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, just kind of a quick question. So, when you're looking at these two different orientations of face-to-face -face or side-by-side, -side, um, is there one that polymerizes faster than the other? Like, if if people are interested in, you know, how long is it going to take for this to happen? I mean, I know it's under, you know, it's inside a picosecond for trajectory, but did you see one happening faster than the other? Mm. Not really, because right now we run our simulation at for a time period of two picoseconds, and uh, I guess for the face-to-face -face configuration, the dimerization is occurring at maybe fifteen hundred femtoseconds. For the side-by-side -side configuration, it's maybe similar, maybe sixteen hundred. Or seventeen hundred. So I guess there is no huge difference. Okay. And then, do you think that? Um, I mean, once you once you hit a laser, I mean, with with UV light, I mean, do you think there's something if you would take it right at the absorption onset, or do you think if you'd use like a specific wavelength a little bit higher, you could change um, how fast the reaction would happen? Yes, absolutely. I guess it is wavelength dependent. So right now, I'm just using. Uh, I guess the first three transitions with the most oscillator strength. Okay. And then do you have, um, do you happen to have which wavelengths those are that correspond to those oscillator strengths, like marked? Mm, not really. I guess maybe it's in the range of five electron volts to six electron volts. So if you if you would use like uh, hybrid functional, you would come maybe a little closer to reality. Yeah. Or or you can take products of uh, reaction and analyze them with uh, like Gaussian MP2 or TDDFT for spectrum. Okay. So you are modeling two monomers. This maximal size of the product is uh, Silicon 12. Yes. What does happen in uh, reality and what is the target pro product for applications? I guess in your case we should consider a liquid. Okay. So, but liquid composed of this uh, silicon 6 is a reactant. And what is the product? What they typically uh, try to obtain? I remember. One of their findings is, so they have this kind of a molecule, and this molecule can undergo dehydrogenation, and then they end up with just a crystal of silica. Yes, yes, crystalline silicon, uh, infinitely large or some uh, confined. Yes. Well, they, they can do printed circuits of infinitely large, but recent I saw would. that it's a quantum dot. Yes, yes, yes. So if uh, you let it grow intermediate lengths, it will grow into quantum dots, mm -hmm. which which are other fun uh, objects to do. John, your co-authors, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Hobby and Sam, and quantum dots that you computed for, for them, for publication, were fabricated with this method. Mm. So, I say after after the local ACS up in Fargo, um, yeah, Eric had kind of uh, mentioned that they had been using this to to generate their their crystals. Yep. 
So you are in some sort of end user of this uh, technology. Mm -hmm. Do you know, um, and I guess this can go to Yulin as well, um, so being able to use this type of um, cyclosilicon compound, is the growth rate of these crystals enhanced or is the size um, uh, the size distribution of the crystals uh, more manageable using this type of molecule versus uh, typical like xylene gas that they might use? I, have no idea. I, I don't know. Probably they do some centrifugation after after they're done, but it doesn't generate more and disperse. It, it uh, creates in anything and then you need to do a homework on s separating the products. Um, mm -hmm. Heating. Were you able to see polymerization just by heating it? I didn't try it. What is the barrier? So if, if they really want to poly polymerize, maybe upon elimination of hydrogen, they are attracted to each other than, than, rather than uh, repelling. The activation barrier for this polymerization shouldn't be very high because you, you get it again and again at different conditions. So maybe even with moderate temperatures like 1000 Kelvin, it will be sufficient for them to, to fuse. Yeah, I can try that. But so for TDSM simulations, I try three trajectories for face to face. Mm -hmm. And I found only one have dimerization. Mm -hmm. The other two molecules just repel with each other. Okay. Okay. Good. More questions? Fatima? You are doing calculations on civilians, mm -hmm. so you will have some questions. Uh, can you please explain a little bit this figure, like how you post this post processing? Which figure? This one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The steps. So, what's your question? This the process? This time dependent excited state. Um, what is molecular dynamics? Yeah, molecular dynamics. Like, what does maybe like saving intermediates mean? Like. So, like you do molecular dynamics. Mm -hmm. You have at each time step you have a set of nuclear positions, right? Mm -hmm. So what I did is I. At each time step, I extract these nuclear positions and then put it to another folder and then run geometry optimization to these intermediates. Okay. Is this something different? Like, Who is <laughs> So it, it is, uh, is it something different like what we I, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, this is something that Dr. Han has came up with. So he he determines the intermediates based off their the, off the atoms' proximity to one another. So if they're within mm -hmm. the bond distance, he considers them to be one intermediate, and then mm -hmm. he goes and takes each one of those intermediates and runs geometry optimization. Okay. But this this procedure uh, is TDSMD is not included into standard software. Okay. It's like. Uh, Unique software with uh, Dr. Han being uh, okay. author or one of, of, of authors, so it's a unique procedure. And the arrow that goes from one box from mm -hmm. left to the right, mm -hmm. why do we need this uh, optimization? Because during the high energy dynamics, the, tra the trajectory includes very unstable transition states, mm -hmm. okay. which uh, there is no sense to analyze them and they are unstable, they can decompose one or another way. Mm -hmm. So one needs to um, bring them into more stable configuration and then see what, 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 what are they. Okay. Make sense? Mm -hmm. I think uh, Dane is the strongest chemist in this audience. <laughs>
by professional educators. <laughs> um, more questions? If not, let's thank uh, Yvonne once again. Four is yours. by saying that my introduction is probably the weakest portion, in my opinion, of my poster. I have too much writing and too many sources, I believe. I've got 23 sources in my introduction alone, so I need to downsize that, obviously. Uh, probably simplify it into uh, important bullet points. But, all right, so we'll get started here. So, purpose of this Research uh, is to increase the stability of rocket fuel used in unmanned spacecraft. So currently, on the fuel that we use in unmanned spacecraft is most favorable for space exploration when it comes to efficiency and price. Um, it's not only easier to, to move spacecrafts with hypergolic fuel in comparison to cryogenic or petroleum fuels, but it's easier to store. Um, the main difficulty with it right now is it's toxic byproducts, and uh, it one of the challenges that we know of <clears throat> regarding these toxic byproducts is the level of toxicity that that is within the uh, the product after combustion of this hypergolic fuel. Specifically, hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide, uh, DTO being the oxidizer and hydrazine being the fuel. So what the goal is here is to understand what mechanisms are occurring and, uh, and to give values to the amount of toxic byproducts that are being created as well as determine the mechanism for the formation of water molecules. Uh, we're interested in water molecules specifically because of the stability factor that they provide to this reaction. Um, so in order to determine this mechanism, a simulation cell was built using Avogadro and uh, molecular dynamics were calculated using VASP software and then this was visualized using VMD software. So start out with the simulation cell. We used a one-to-one -one ratio of fuel to oxidizer using high temperature and high pressure, specifically 3,500 Kelvin and 729 cubic angstrom cell. So this is pictured here on the bottom left. You could see an initial time step of zero. So that's what the cell looks like. Initially, there's four hydrogen for the nitrogen tetroxide. Yes, sorry. Um, so, I present that you know nothing. Yeah. So, you are showing cell size. Yes. Does it mean that uh, you're, you don't have infinite amount of vacuum? It, it means you do you use periodic boundary conditions? Yes. Good. Correct. Yes. Okay. And be ready to answer what they are. Okay. So what are periodic boundary conditions? What are periodic boundary conditions? So periodic boundary conditions, uh, if not being used, says that your reaction is confined to the simulation cell, whereas in this simulation instead, um, it's unit cells basically reoccurring at each boundary so if the combustion allows for the molecules t to go through one side of the boundary, it'll appear again on the other side of the reaction cell. Excellent. Okay. So where was I? Um, oh, so we'll go, all right, my methods are pretty poor right now as well. Um, I realized that 
my equations don't even go in numbered order. I'm missing a number five equation. And I, th I like I, I read the saying like, what a humble presenter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I think the way that Aaron presented his methods, I like. So I'm going to try and do that. Try and uh, just give a name to each equation. And perhaps instead of defining each one at the end, um, like each what each letter represents, uh, define it after each equation would probably be a better way to do it so that you don't have to go hunting for them. Um, okay, so as far as results go, the mechanism for the formation of water was determined. Um, you can see here there's three main reactions that are occurring with, uh, with the formation of water. And the, so the question arises, are these reactions that we're visualizing using VMD accurate? Or can, we, can we trust them? Um, because VMD, they display these bonds based off of, off of distance. So if, if two atoms are within close proximity to each other, um, it's assumed that they're bonded to one another in most cases. So it's important to look at electron density and um, looking at the bottom panel of reactions there for the formation of water, we can see on the fourth panel that the electron density cloud surrounds the water molecule specifically. So we know that the formation of water occurs um, just from... Can you circle water? Yes. Operated this because some, uh, I haven't learned how to how it works. Sometimes this panel appears. So there we see the water. Here we see the water. So you, you may do it on um, poster as well. Oh, no, I didn't mean to make that one. Yes, okay. Um, how do I get out of this now? Uh, maybe instead of pen, select like highlighter or laser pointer. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> okay. Um, or maybe just escape. In worst case, oh, it no. will just save um, and start presentation over. <laughs> if you do. I don't know why my slideshow kept those animations, but all right. So we can see the formation of water. Um, this mechanism is consistent with just the first water molecule that's formed throughout the combustion mechanism. So this actually needs to be changed as well. Um, my graphs here on the bottom, the top one corresponds to actually the last molecule of water that's formed, not the first. There's three that's formed throughout this one-to-one -one ratio on a 500 femme to second uh, process. So this blue line represents the distance in angstroms between the oxygen from the water molecule and the hydrogen which it accepts to create a water molecule. And the red line represents the nitrogen which donates its hydrogen and the distance between those two. So we can see that as the distance of the blue line approaches one angstrom, the distance of the red line goes to infinity, um, in theory or whatever. But So when it reaches one angstrom is when the water molecule forms. Um, what's important that I don't have on here is the total energy of the system when this occurs. So 
the formation of water is an endothermic process and that can be proved by looking at the total energy of the system and that will be outlined on my poster Thursday. Um, on the bottom graph we see a theoretical mass spec. Um, so by taking each time... Uh, sorry. Th theoretical or computed by your own uh, data? Computed by my own data. So highlighted okay. because Theoretical has some ambiguity. Simulated mass spec. Yes. Okay. So original simulated data from from this trajectory. Okay. Otherwise, like maybe there is a theory in a smart book or yep. journal. Okay. So um, yeah, simulated mass spec. So we can see all products which are formed throughout every time interval of the combustion mechanism. Uh, we see. Sorry for interrupting. Can you indicate uh, where are the reactants on this mass spectrum? Yes. Okay, so I will just say right now for the purpose you, you can just show show it there. Yes. So the very last peak that we see here, around ninety three or so, is our the nitrogen tetroxide molecule, our oxidizer, and around thirty four we see our hydrazine peak, which is the second largest peak on the, on the mass spec here, which indicates that it is the second most occurring molecule behind nitrogen dioxide, which is a product of dinitrogen tetroxide breaking down. Would it be correct to say that if you freeze your um, simulation cell, to like absolute zero, then after long time there will be only peaks corresponding to reactants. Correct. And no products developing. Correct. At absolute zero, yes, there should not be any any movement, so the the molecule should stay in their original. So you can even highlight the reactants with different color, or just put lines artificial bars and uh, again same as with Aaron you will be a teacher for most of your visitors yeah. they they will not doubt your knowledge they will try to understand what you mean by short time so do not hesitate to to teach very simple things okay. appeal to their common sense okay so overall the important things to take from this study is that we now know the mechanism for the formation of water a step-by-step -step mechanism as well as we know we can we can give a, a, a variable or I don't know if that's the right word um, we can label I guess the the byproducts not just the end byproducts, but the products throughout simulation. So those which occur for only a short time, as well as those which are stable configurations, which which stay in one of the most stable ones, which don't decompose, is water. So the more water that we have, the more stable our reaction fuel is. And if we could get the max amount of water by changing the ratio of fuel to oxidizer, it would decrease the amount of toxic byproducts which form. Another um, future plan for decreasing toxic byproducts would be introducing uh, catalysts such as platinum nanocrystals. Okay, but thank Dane. So do you have uh, questions? John? Um, so, and and I think you may have mentioned this, but so are you using just standard molecular dynamics that come available from VAST software to run these simulations? Yes. Okay. And do you know what the um, actual pressure is? Um, I know you give the temperature and the volume, but I didn't know. Do you know what the calculated pressure is for the system? I have it. I don't off the top of my head. 
Okay. Um, and then my other, my last question is, so in terms of your simulated mass spec that you show, right, that's a, that's a summation of fragments along the total trajectory. Yes. It's a, it's, okay. Yep. Okay. So, and then, go ahead, go ahead. Well, no, you can answer first. Well, I was going to say, so like Eulen was saying with his mass spec, it takes uh, a snapshot at each time inter interval and calculates fragments and then compiles them by their occurrences. Okay. And then um, just for curiosity, uh, had you ever considered putting, if you just take the mass spec from your initial uh, system and plotting it on the same as your final mass spec from the dynamic trajectory. That way, you could show, you know, the drop in uh, product or uh, reactant formation or reactant molecules, just to show. Well, I don't know how much that would bring to the table, simply because we only have two molecules to start out with. I mean, we may have one. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, so the intensity of them is going to be. You know, it'll, there'll only be two peaks, it, so it's it's expected that those peaks should decrease through time because it's a hypergolic fuel. You, there's no it, there's no requirement of energy input in order to get this ball rolling. Okay. Do you agree with that, or do you think? Well, do I you mean, think, do you think that having a like a before and after is that what you're saying of the mass spec? Mm -hmm. Right, because I mean, you have you have a, a chemical reaction occurring, so there should be some type of new product forming and a decrease in the number of um, potential reactants, right? Because it's not like you have an actual catalyst that sustains its own um, uh, number of, of molecules through the through the reaction. Well, it, it, I think it's important to note that this mass spec isn't the number of molecules which exist it's the occurrence of molecules which exist so it's it if you were to take a mass spec at time step initial one you would see equal intensity peaks of hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide so i see what you're saying but i don't know i don't know if a graph of that would explain better than simply this picture, you know? Because if you were to take a mass spec of time step zero, you would just have two peaks, right? Uh, yeah, potentially. I mean, if that's Whereas, if that's okay. the only thing. Oh, you're saying okay. I, I see what you're saying. So instead of taking instead of taking a time dependent mass spec, you're saying take. Uh, an image of time step zero and an image of time step 500 and compare those two? Well, I mean, so so the mass spec that you have here, you know, you have how many different peaks, right? Because you have things fragmenting, you have uh, products forming. If you would plot, a, a, you know, a mass spec of just time zero on top of that, you should, like you said, see two peaks of your two products of equivalent value. But none of the other peaks would exist, right. and so I didn't know if that would graphically help. You know, the idea of yes, we do see all of these things forming, rather than you know some of just the snapshots. But so as I understand, uh, John is not trying to criticize. He suggests uh, tricks that will help intuitive understanding for general audience. A reference point. So have have just a red line to the top of the graph at N2H4 and a red line to the top at N2O4 and say red is initial products and blue is all occurring react or all occurring fragments throughout the simulation. Yeah, I get right. It. I mean it's yeah. I mean it's just a really quick quick thing you can put in and it gives people an idea of you know what's actually occurring if they don't feel like sitting and reading everything. Right. That's yeah. No. Absolutely. And that, that is another point. So with with my presentation itself on on the poster, how how do you guys feel about having these paragraphs of words? Is that too much? 
Cool. You think, or is that is that okay to leave what I have? I mean, like I said, I have 23 sources right now listed there. So, well, if you um, <laughs> if you do not if you do not give them in your bibliography, then you cannot you cannot cite thing. You cannot give a number if you do not uh, decompose it into full right. citation. So that's what I mean. I'd have to have a list of 23 in my bibliography. And you will not have <laughs> a place to do it. Just right. select something more important. Okay. And um, feel, do, do whatever you feel comfortable. Uh, it's not last time in your life you do poster. You, you will just uh, gain experience and uh, you will see people uh, behaving like um, zero understanding square eyes like what is it here? And the next time, and then you will see that if you point and guide people, they understand better. But there are some old fashioned and uh, biologically old people who prefer continuous grammatically correct text, but typically they are in minority. <laughs> All right. I don't know, my undergrad advisor, he said paragraphs are stupid for posters, so okay. that's just some people's philosophy. That's good. That when, was I, when I was doing a post, of my, I was trying to do broken bullet points and my advisor was always like uh, tearing last hairs from his 70 years old head and I, I do not understand, do a complete sentence. So there are different opinions. Um, can I contribute? Yes, please. So it is for, for John. You see this average? I'm trying to point in the equation six. Yep. So the, um, well, one equation is, is missed here. The equation, and you didn't change the notation. So equation five, if you put it here, yep. should uh, define this mass spec as function of mz at time t. Yes. We, which will include the delta function of mz minus M F yeah of T right and, and summation equals M S of T. But then what is shown in in equation six is an average over the whole trajectory. So it is uh, it is not time dependence, but it is integrated time dependence. Mm -hmm. So the, even if by the end of reaction there are no reactants in the simulation cell, the final uh, would still show up. Still show them, and yep. this is made for the following purpose: if you look for number of molecules of let's say reactant, it will be very very. Uh, there are just four of them, and it will mm -hmm. uh, show like weathers down, or it will show some discrete oscillations that are uh, kind of strange and uh, this average um, makes something more reasonable yeah. which can be interpreted no, as uh, there is a ensemble of reactions going in parallel and one reaction stopped earlier another stopped later and we give some average uh, outcome mm -hmm. So, so basically, you use the same uh, type of idea with these ensemble trajectories, kind of like um, Eluna is doing, but you don't implement like Rabi oscillation cycling. Correct. Okay. So the post processing is the same as in all works by by you, but but the engine is a little more simple. It's uh, regular molecular dynamics instead of TDSMD. Mm -hmm. More 
questions to Dane? If not, I'd thank him once again. Yes, yes. So good luck with uh, please collect feedback. John, if you have some feedback, please email it directly to uh, authors. Okay. So uh, good luck with uh, completing your posters and please figure out how to print and where to, to post them. Even if you are not presenting, you are welcome to stop by and watch uh, group members and other other presenters. I don't think anyone will check if you are registered or not. This should be like open. Where is it? Where is it located? Is it in the prairie room and upstairs of the union? I wish I know. It will be a big. Uh, I'm not very organized. I will be figuring it out at last minute. I also need to present there. So you'll be just running with the computer and looking at like which room should I? I think believe I said it was the alumni center. Okay. Oh, the alumni center is. Um, they have less rules. Some things that are forbidden in uh, memorial unit are allowed in uh, alumni room. Yeah, you can drink in there. Um. Okay, and um, so good luck in presenting. Many thanks for uh, collective contributions. Uh, meeting is dismissed, and um, I will ask by personal emails help with uh, proposal development.